Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Welcome to the November 29, 2018 special meeting of the Trinity County Planning Commission. Public comment. Members of the public may address the Planning Commission concerning matters within their own jurisdiction or district and which are not listed on tonight's agenda and request that the matter be agendized for a future meeting. No action may be taken on these matters at this meeting. Anyone wishing to address the commission, please come forward. State your name for the record. Being that there is no public comment, we will move on from public comment to agenda item number three minutes for October 25th, 2018. Commissioners, any corrections or clarifications on the minutes as written? I'll move to approve the minutes. A second. Motion. Motion to approve minutes as stated and second. Those in favor of the motion presented? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? None. Motion carries unanimously. Old business, none. New business. Agenda item number four, proposed mitigative negative declaration and cannabis conditional use permit. Applicant Hoffman. Good evening, commissioners. As you know, recently the county contracted SA10 and they are preparing our cannabis use permits. Um, they're preparing some other standard planning items as well, but they started with conditional use permits that were submitted for cannabis. This evening we have the Hoffman CUP that includes a type 3 cultivation site, cannabis nursery, and a cannabis distribution facility. We have Mark Cheney here, he's a principal planner from SA10 and he will present the staff report. He's also going to give you a little bit of an overview regarding what our relationship is between the SA10 and the county and how they're handling all of these use permits. So if you have any questions and a little bit of an overview regarding CEQA as well, but if you have any questions. Please ask. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, again, as so Leslie mentioned, my name is Mark Cheney. I'm with the uh, SHN office in Reading. Um, we have uh, been hired by the county to help out with uh, a range of uh, planning uh, projects, uh, specifically for this one here, the uh, cannabis CUPs, helping to uh, the county to help process them on, on at least the middle side of that with the uh, CEQA documentation and helping go through with the uh, staff reports and making sure they're in compliance with uh, the current ordinances. Um, what I'd like to do is I'll, I'll go through a couple things. One of the things that before I get into the meat of the staff report, I just want to take a real quick minute. Uh, you're probably well aware of the CEQA process. Uh, some of the audience may not be. I just kind of wanted to do a, kind of a quick review in terms of what it is and what it isn't because sometimes that helps clarify uh, some questions. Um, you know, CEQA is uh, required by the state on, on projects, and especially for projects that have discretionary approval, such as a use permit. Um, there, you know, it's, it's really a system as we try to look at it in terms of checks and balances to make sure that what an applicant is asking for complies with uh, environmental rules and regulations of the state, of an ordinance of the county. And we really just look at the, you know, the potential effects of the project not so much whether we agree with the project or not, has absolutely no bearing on it. Um, you know, the information is really for you as a decision maker to understand what the, the pluses and minuses of the project are in terms of the uh, environmental, the physical environmental effects of the project. Um, try to identify ways to avoid impacts as much as possible or reduce them to a level that's acceptable to the, to the county. And it's a, it's a venue to give the, uh, the public an opportunity to review the project, um, voice their concerns uh, and uh, you know, opinions in favor of or against the project uh, that may, may or may not have uh, some resonance with the county. The biggest thing that I always try to let people know is what CEQA isn't. Um, you know, it's, it doesn't advocate for a project and it doesn't oppose a project. Try to keep the process neutral in terms of what is there what the impacts are. Um, it does not, you know, require project denial because there's an adverse impact. And if there's an adverse impact, there's a process to assess that and, and indicate why it's, it may have a, a, an impact, uh, provide mitigation measures to reduce the impacts. Uh, there are times when we can't reduce the impacts. 
and there are, there are provisions to go ahead and approve a project if it is in the best interest of, of the local agency. Um, and we can really discuss the merits of the proposed project, what it does, uh, not so much, you know, where we're at. But it doesn't really, it doesn't really go into advocation for why this is a good project, why this is a bad project. Again, it's more of a, an even-handed process, trying to get the, the planning commission and, if it needs to go, at the board of supervisors level, let them know what the, the scope of the project is and impacts. So with that, we, we took the information and worked with um, the applicant to review the project, make sure we understood what the project was, got some clarification on several items, and came up and prepared the uh, mitigated neck deck. I, I know that everyone loves to read these and review them. Uh, they're fun, fun things to do. But in that process, we have identified um, the project itself. I just wanted to go through out of the staff report and give everyone an overview of the project. Um, you know, the applicant proposes to uh, develop a cannabis cultivation site and up to one acre uh, type T3. Develop a cannabis nursery and, and prop, propagation of cannabis for wholesale. And develop a cannabis distribution facility. Um, the, proposed, the applicants propose that all development will occur on land that's been previously used for industrial purposes. Uh, proposed cannabis cultivation activities are going to consist of a combination of above ground wooden planter beds and outdoor full sun conditions and or a series of 10 by 100 hoop houses using light deprivation. Uh, the cultivation area currently supports a county type 2 cultivation license and occupies about a 10,000 square foot footprint. Um, it's in an area that was previously used, or many of you probably are aware of the old Boom Boom facility out there in Hay Fork that was the fireworks facility. It's inside, most of the work is inside the bunker that has been previously disturbed. It's got berms, it's had excavation, it's had a lot of disturbance out there. And um, it's got a, about a roughly about a 12 to 16 foot berm around that facility there, so it's it's inside an area. Um, the cannabis nursery facility is going to be kind of a mixture of the existing buildings out there. There's uh, going to be some greenhouses and new hoop houses for propagation. Uh, the distribution facility is in the, going to be an existing facility. There's about a 34,000 square foot building out there that's going to be used. Um, it was left over from the past uh, industrial uses out on site. So it's going to be repurposed for uh, refrigerated shipping containers. And distribution facility will transport cannabis between license types uh, to testing facilities. And um, we have the planning department's got the related documentation on file for all the applications, the three application types that are in there. Um, the CEQA document uh, evaluated the project, uh, looked at the uh, various items, we had uh, a few recommendations in terms of mitigation measures. Uh, there's a mitigation monitoring and reporting program, which is pretty pretty minor. It uh, deals with cultural resources for unknown and un unidentified cultural resources that might be present uh, during activation activities. Other than that, we found that the project would have a uh, less sensitive impact. Um, the project went through the state clearinghouse at, in Sacramento for a 30-day agency comment review period. It was also open to the public at that time. Uh, the county's processed this and posted notices for availability of the document for review. Um, we had uh, comments from, uh, no comments from the public in, in the area. We had some comments from uh, Fish and Wildlife, uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife, and um, we reviewed those comments and determined that Based on the, uh, the documentation itself, there was no additional work that needed to be done uh, for that process. Um, in that, we had uh, Native American Heritage Commission also provided a comment, but that had mainly been taken care of by the cultural resource applicant uh, for the project. So in the, uh, in the two comments themselves, they are in, contained in the body of staff report with responses to that. Um, we also looked at, in terms of uh, compatibility with the area, uh, with the past historic use out there, uh, industrial uses, the proposed uses uh, seem to fit within the uh, spirit of the, the area, uh, so to speak, at the time. And from that, we made a list of recommendations for the Planning Commission. Those are on the, the second page of the staff report. And based on um, those comments that we received, the, the documentation we prepared for the initial study, uh, the, uh, 
discussions with the county planning staff, and the recommendation is that uh, there be an adoption of a resolution of findings, uh, that the initial study and the plan declaration, that they're consistent with CEQA, was very consistent with CEQA, the requirements that the mitigation and monitoring and reporting program be adopted. Uh, we have provided a series of recommended um, conditions of approval that tie into either information provided in the CEQA document or uh, relevance to the project as it relates to the cannabis ordinances for the county and recommend approval of the conditional use permit for the type 3 license. Also recommend approval for the use permit for the cannabis nursery uh, subject to all the conditions and the same re recommend approval of the conditional use permit for the distribution facility subject to the conditions of approval in the staff report. And all of these conditions of approval are in addition to the current standards of the cannabis use permit ordinances. So we're not recommending anything really different other than we've added on some things that are specific to uh, county planning requirements between various other agencies of the county. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions and invite yeah, information. Thank you, Mr. Cheney. Commissioners, any questions or clarifications? Uh, this item does carry a public uh, public hearing, so anyone wishing to address the commission regarding this item, please come forward. State your name for the record. Good evening, Chambers for Chris Cape Park. <coughs> um, I guess first and foremost, I've been told to support this project as a grower in Cape Park. Uh, actually been friends with so many. Now that I've talked pretty intimately, it would be refreshing to see it happen. Um, my other comment has absolutely nothing to do with Soma's project at all. Uh, it just was brought to light that we need to be very careful going through these things. Um, as we just heard in the staff report, um, and the gentleman from SHN told us part of their job contracting, and I've worked with SHN years ago with Mr. Barsanti. Um, I would say only the highest things about SHN, but as he said, it's their job to review to make sure that it's in compliance with our county ordinance with all of that. Um, the proposed state ordinance, or state regs, say you cannot use shipping containers. Now, as somebody who knows the facility, it would be the most sensible, best practice. But how is something like that, everybody in the room knows that I've had issues with planning, but how is something like that getting to this level that is kind of the basis of the project? It's an easy thing to go refrigerate the rooms, you know? But how are we getting to this step in the process where Sony's worked his butt off of this? And it's gone through planning, it's gone through all these dates that I'm going through the same process, that, you know? And I don't want to get to the finish line where Sony's at right now and then be like, oh, actually, this whole study we did, we oversaw that it actually doesn't work, even though in any good sense it would. I think it should be approved. I know this isn't easy to fix for because I've stood in the facility and talked about the building and pretty great But that's, I know there's tons of rules, I know there's tons of loops for jumping through and new stuff, but like, how can, I guess it's sort of a question, how can an applicant going through a CUP process ensure that, I mean, this is a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of effort for everybody involved. You know, so it's like a year into the process to not get to that stuff. So, some of them. You give us your question. Good evening, commissioners. John Brown from Kansas City. Uh, I want to encourage approval uh, of this project. Uh, the, uh, the applicant proposing uh, quite low impact uses on uh, a piece of property that's zoned for the very highest uh, impacts. And, uh, it seems to be an easy fit and uh, create a real asset to the community and uh, uh, these distribution and nursery. 
sure your license types are long overdue here. And uh, I would encourage uh, both the commission and staff to um, uh, ease this project through um, as quickly and simply as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brower. Anyone else with comments regarding this agenda item? My name is Gail Goodyear. <clears throat> I live in Louisville. Um, however, I do represent people who own property in Newport, and I have reviewed business plans for people who are operating businesses throughout Trinity County. Um, I received a, the letter of notification for public comment after the deadline. So, um, Anyway, I wanted to note that, that um, I re for a previous issue earlier in the year, I received the notification and I had to drop everything and reply within three days. And so um, there seems to be a timeline problem there. But people in Trinity County are very, very opinionated about the use of pesticides and herbicides. And they have asked the county to employ regulations to limit use on county property. Also, um, the forest landowners have been held to a very high standard also. And within the document that I read, it said that um, you can apply pesticides and herbicides um, if the wind is growing 10 miles an hour or less. And so the drift could be considerable. So the business plans that I reviewed for organic growers in Trinity County, I encourage you to believe that this particular project could impact their ability to be certified. And so I want to encourage you that we would like people to make money, but we would like all of them to make money. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goodyear. exciting day for some of us um, in Hay Park. I think that the cannabis cultivation community needs facilities that are being proposed today to really make the whole process work for us in the industry. I think we need more than just a couple, but this is a good start. And um, this site is fairly, um, been used for fairly industrial purposes in the past, so to me it seems like a reasonable fit. Um, I just might want to mention to the commission that while um, cannabis farmers are not allowed to use the organic standards and labels that the federal government regulates, the application and use of pesticides is extremely restricted for cannabis cultivation. Um, things that are allowed to be used on almost every vineyard in this county, <coughs> on the golf course, and many other facilities around use regulated pesticides that cannabis cultivators are not allowed to use. In fact, cannabis cultivators are almost exclusively restricted to what are called 23B exempt pesticides. Neem oil, cinnamon oils, sulfur. Um, none of your typical um, pesticides and herbicides you would come to think of being used on, on any crop. And essentially the standards are higher than the organic standards that the FDA regulates. And the products are being tested at parts per billion for residual pesticides. Um, <clears throat> that is such a small number that in parts per billion, I, my brain can't even really wrap around it. But uh, just to real, belay any concerns from the community, the pesticides allowed to be used in cannabis are not what we think of as pesticides typically. And they are most of just oils and other natural products that don't come out of a laboratory. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Hopkins. Hi, uh, Jeff Gadella Xenia. Uh, I don't know Sony really. Uh, 
I've never done business with them. I don't even know if I ever will, just because I'm not quite sure what I'll be developing and how it would serve my farm. I am a licensed cultivator. Um, but approving this project is something good for the county, um, for the cultivation industry. Um, it, it, it potentially gives us a hub to move our product to market, a market which we're pretty far away from. Uh, we are isolated up here, and this is a step in the right direction. The impact seems pretty minimal. Um, and just to reiterate what Justin said, um, the, the, the pesticides we're allowed to use are so limited and really come from natural sources. None of it's synthetic, none of it's systemic. Um, we run more risk of our crops getting um, cross-contaminated by growing next to inorganic you know, fields. This is something that's happening in other areas, not so much here. That's one of the benefits of growing up here. Um, I don't believe there's any product allowed for use in California on cannabis that could trigger um, tr trigger some type of cross-contamination on another organic product. Um, I'm, I'm no expert, but just as far as what we're allowed to use, if you look at the list, it is oil extracts for herbs. It's, it's, it's nothing that you can't pronounce or spell. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Goodell. Any other comments from the public regarding this agenda item? <coughs> that there's no real close public comment. Bring it back to the commission. Thank you for your comments. I do have a, a question for Mr. Teen in, um, in light of some comments. I am curious as to the 10 miles an hour, if the wind exceeds or that's the threshold, whether you know, spraying will be allowed. Where did this number come from? Is this stipulated? And, I believe just. I, I'm back on, I've been working on a couple different counties right now, so I'm trying to, trying to think of which. I believe on this one here, there is a, a stipulation on kind of a standard measure that uh, agricultural commissioners throughout California are using as kind of a threshold for um, drift. Uh, 10 miles an hour is about, we heard a comment about uh, vineyards and other things. That's a very common practice, especially with any type of dry uh, product. Um, the drift outside at 10 miles an hour does tend to go off-site if the wind is blowing in that off-site uh, with the uh, wet product, depending upon the particulate size of the of the application, obviously, it's going to change. But there is about a 10 mile an hour <coughs> threshold we look at, uh, kind of a standard of a conventional standard of practice uh, that's, that's accepted by a lot of the ag communities. Some places less, depending upon the, the severity of the um, adjacent uses. Uh, we have residences adjacent to them or any type of other um, sensitive receptors, they may have a lower threshold. We've had, we have had projects in the past on agricultural type projects where we've had um, the threshold lowered and actually have limited the use of dry chemicals um, adjacent to properties where we have, you know, uh, residences or other types of crops that could be contaminated. So, it, 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 but it is kind of a threshold. Thank you, Mr. Chief. adopt the resolution and findings that the initial study and mitigated negative declaration are consistent with the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, requirements and adopt the Mitigated Monitoring and Reporting Program, MMRP. Approve the conditional use permit for development of a cannabis type 3 use subject to the conditions of approval for that use as provided in this staff report and the county's cannabis ordinance. Approve the conditional use permit for development of a cannabis nursery use subject to the conditions of approval for that use as provided in this staff report and of the county's cannabis ordinance and approve the conditional use permit for development of a cannabis distribution facility 
subject to the conditions of approval for that use as provided in the staff report and of the condition of the county's cannabis ordinance and um, as well as the findings of fact and the conditions as stated in this, all conditions and findings of fact as stated in the staff report. Is there a second, Commissioners? I'll second. Mm -hmm. uh, motion for approval initiated by Commissioner Stewart, seconded by Commissioner Matthews. Further discussion? And that there's not those in favor of the motion presented as stated? Aye. 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 Those opposed? None. Motion carries unanimously. Next item on the agenda, tonight's agenda, item number five, community discussion and workshop, uh, proposed Class K housing ordinance, applicant, Trinity County. For, uh, for this particular item, with the permission of staff and the commission, I've presented a PowerPoint, or I've prepared a PowerPoint presentation. I'd like to, to take a, a few minutes to present it, if I may. Uh, again, uh, we discussed previously, and because it is a workshop setting, it's somewhat less informal, so uh, we'll do the presentation and take public comment afterwards and just, you know, so you can just proceed with, with how it goes. So thank you. Before I will take a little more of a more informal setting to do this presentation. Um, so, limited density owner built rural dwelling. This is the formal name according to state legislature. Uh, or unofficially, it's known as Class K housing. This term originated from Mendocino County uh, from a, a ordinance that was approved and enacted in 1986 in Mendocino. What I'm here to present to you tonight is somewhat along the same lines, but something tailored specifically to Trinity County. And not only that, something that is taken into account, changes in state legislation, health and safety code, and fire code that has taken, uh, taken place over the past 30 years. So let's start with what is Class K? Where did this come from? Class K, or limited density, owner-built rural dwelling was first introduced in California state legislature basically in the, night, in the late 1960s. The intent uh, um, was to facilitate for property owners in rural areas to be able to build the, their, their, basically their, their houses for themselves and the family. It was understood that due to the geographical isolation of these dwellings, it wasn't really necessary for them to adhere strictly to what was then the California Building Code in every aspect of it. Um, I want to make clear that this intent still stands to this day. Uh, many, or some that are opposed to Class K have noted that, well, this doesn't work anymore. This is simply obsolete because uh, too many changes have taken place over the years. I'm here to tell you that this is simply not true. I've been in contact with uh, associates from, from the uh, Department of Housing Authority and Community, Community Development in Sacramento and lawyers for this institution, and they have confirm the current validity of this type of ordinance. Furthermore, there are currently seven other counties in California that have uh, an active Class K type of ordinance. Uh, again, the intention at the time was to relax the building code for uh, builders of uh, single family built in rural areas. And this intention still stands today. So what type of buildings are, would you be allowed to build under this Class K? Well, you could most definitely uh, do a conventional or quote-unquote conventional stick framing, uh, post and beam, prefabricated, pre-engineered structures, a hybrid of these, uh, straw bale, for example. Uh, there's a whole array that can open up um, of different uh, structure types under this ordinance. As long as they're built responsible, they're approved by county officials, and they're done with structural integrity. Now, um, as noted, limited density in rural, uh, to abide by these requirements in state legislature, um, it was deemed necessary or deemed appropriate to exclude the main four community service districts in the county, which is Waterworks District 1, a uh, mainly downtown a the Weaverville Service District, um, 
the Lewiston Service District and Coffee Creek Trinity Center uh, Service District. Also, um, with the uh, intent to, for rurality or rural, uh, it was deemed that 2.5 acres minimum would be uh, the threshold for, for you to apply. Basically, your property needs to be two and a half acres or larger. Um, so why would you go with the, tradition, uh, with the traditional approach in building, in procedure, in application versus a class K? Well, um, the reasons could be many, uh, depending on your personal circumstances. However, one, one aspect that is always paramount in any building project is cost. And we can all agree to that. So under a class K approach, uh, can, um, a construction approach in the fact that new building systems could be introduced in the county would facilitate, would allow uh, owners to strategize in different ways and in, in how, how they want to build their, their residence. They want to use uh, home milled lumber, recycled materials. I mean, there's a whole extent and array of possibilities that open up. Also, a geographical isolation. Um, I've been in the building and engineering industry for 20 years or so, and one thing I have seen very clearly here in Trinity County is the more isolated you are within the community, the more, the more expensive your building project is. It's just simply mathematics. It's, a lot of building professionals don't want to drive two, three hours to you know, take on a project. I mean, cost of delivery, cost of labor, transportation, getting equipment there, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the, the prices are exponential. I have literally seen bids come in twice as much as uh, it would normally be in, in any other location just because of the isolation. So uh, this would definitely benefit those, benefit those approaching a class K. Also, um, less stringent, cumbersome approach. Uh, I'm constantly doing more research on uh, methodologies of construction, new materials to be used, uh, latest amendments to the building code or international building code, residential code. So for a homeowner that wants to simply build a house for themselves and their dwelling, I mean for a dwelling for himself and or herself and their family, um, it's quite the process to take on to adhere to every aspect of the building code. So this would tailor and help the owners strategize in a less cumbersome way. So what is the pr purpose of introducing Class A specifically to Trinity County? I believe it would create opportunity and empowerment for our community members to be able to make the best use of their resources and their land that are available to them. Um, it would bring creativity, as, again, as I mentioned before, uh, an introduction to new building types. Um, again, I, I mentioned briefly in the last uh, last uh, slide benefit to those geographically isolated due to construction costs. Also, help fire victims rebuild. I live in Junction City. Seventy homes were built, uh, burnt down last year. I know personally many families that still have no place to live, and they're, they're couch surfing or, or whatever they're doing. You know, and, and it's it's sad because either their lack of insurance, lack of resources, a cumbersome county approach to allow them to rebuild. Uh, it makes it difficult for them. And so this Class K would not only benefit them and the realities to be, it would benefit those of future fire victims as well and make it easier for uh, these folks to put a dignified roof over the heads and their, uh, over their heads and their families. Also, during community social benefits and economic growth, uh, communities, community and social benefits, it is well known fact that we have a big housing shortage in Trinity County. Um, there's just a big lack of, of, of affordable housing. So under a Class K banner, uh, these, this issue could be alleviated and bring, bring some relief in that sense. It could also allow owners to invest in their land and therefore invest it in their community and become a more part of this or, or a stronger part of it. Economic growth, um, by introducing this, this other type of building structure, it could bring uh, more labor, more jobs to the community. Um, it could bring, uh, you know, more retail businesses as well. Furthermore, by once a, a, a dwelling would be approved, it would go to the assessor's office, and they would initiate the, the taxation of it, and therefore would bring more, more revenues uh, to the county as well. So now that we have briefly overviewed where Class K came from, the purpose of introducing it, let's look over some things uh, that are in the proposed ordinance administrative requirements, regulations, and construction regulations. Uh, permits and fees, 
you're going to have to, just like any other building uh, project, this will carry its traditional approach. You're going to have to uh, submit your uh, application, you know, your construction documents, um, go through the permit process, and uh, of course pay your fees for the administrative uh, requirements of such. Uh, building permits under this type class K, it would be valid for three years since you get your approval. Uh, you have three years, basically the clock starts ticking, you have three years to complete your project. However, within the ordinance, there's also uh, an allowance uh, for county officials or, or county inspectors to give you uh, an extension of time, depending on your circumstances. Um, inspections, minimal of a three. And the 1986 Mendocino Code, uh, you only needed one inspection, which was your final year certific certificate of occupancy. Um, this is deemed somewhat, I don't know, not irresponsible would be the word. I don't know what word I'm looking for, but I, not prudent. I, I, I think, uh, so in the proposed ordinance, um, it's introduced a minimal of three. One at your foundation uh, system, one at your roofing, which would be to assess your walls, your roofing system, how it all ties in. You can also have your electrical, mechanical, and plumbing inspected, and then one final for a certificate of occupancy. Now, this is not set in stone. There's also leeway that if uh, building officials or inspectors would like to or feel that's necessary to have more inspections, they have the liberty to do so. So they allow some flexibility as well. Uh, recorded covenants, transparency. This is uh, this has brought, brought, been brought up. Uh, I, I had the chance to talk to some, several realtors here in, in town, and this was uh, one thing that uh, they were mostly concerned for them. Uh, say, okay, you build your Class K building, great. Um, five years from now, you want to sell your property. How do you know that, that that was built under a Class K banner, or was it built under, you know, observing every uh, item of the International Building Code? So basically, by in the ordinance, it's asked county council to provide some sort of mechanism to record your class K dwelling with your land. So once whoever comes to buy, buy such a piece of land um, and they do their due diligence, it would become automatic or it would show up that, well, the dwelling on site was built under class K. So it protects all parties involved. Um, last thing on the administrative re regulations is substandard buildings. I added this hot picture, kind of a joke, but it's not a joke. It's We don't want to see this. We, we want to we wanna have buildings that are, are properly and structurally sound. Um, so therefore, I, uh, within the proposed ordinance is included California Health and Safety Code 17920-3. Basically what this is, it's a whole list within the California legislation that if your Class K building or your building, whichever it is, if anything within that building um, falls under any of these categories within the state legislation, your building would de be deemed substandard. Therefore, the county would be allowed to abate either by rehabilitation or removal. So, again, we're, we're trying to facilitate this class K, but at the same time, take mitigated measures and, and, to, to, and set a, a, a standard of quality as well. So, there's other administrative regulations within the ordinance, but these are this is the only uh, slide uh, of this for the presentation because I deem these were perhaps the most relevant or important to, to discuss. Um, there's three slides that I have in terms of structural and construction requirements. The first one is snow loads. Snow loads are very important for Trinity County. Um, we don't really have a huge seismic event field here. Um, not a whole lot of wind, not a whole lot of dynamic loading on structures. However, snow is of a consideration. Uh, this map that you see here on the on the PowerPoint is the Trinity County snow map overlay. This is uh, basically it indicates uh, what snow load geographically depending on the geographical location. Uh, the snow load for the county ranges from 25 uh, pounds per square foot. Usually this is Sawyer, which is uh, the lowest elevation in the county to 350, but that's basically the top of Thompson Peak. So anyways, there's, there's a whole uh, array. Um, it was deemed prudent, uh, again, as a mitigative structure measure to put a threshold of, so if your class A structure is in a location that's over 50 pounds per square feet, it automatically triggers a roof pitch of six, uh, six and 12, and with metal roofing. The reason is, is uh, the angle of repose of snow, basically at a part, that's approximately a 30 degree angle, so at that point, snow, doesn't really stick, it just slides off. So like it just kind of 
it, it creates an incentive for, or not an incentive for snow to, to stick and basically just be shut off the roof. And it's because one consideration, of course, is snow loading. Um, and then so to alleviate that or mitigate that, the, the added of that loading. Um, within the ordinance is also just uh, reference FEMA document P957, Snow Load Safety Guide. This is a very comprehensive guide. It's about 50 pages. Uh, it tells you very practical considerations and solutions to avoid snow loading. For example, placement of HVAC systems on a roof or, or transitions in roof slope. Basically, it like indicates possible potential problems for you to avoid so basically the snow does not accumulate. So, next slide is a height limitation. Um, to get some somewhat flex, some more flexibility to uh, to uh, to having just a one-story building, uh, one and one half is is included. Some counties don't have height limitations. Uh, again, the purpose of introducing this is a mitigating structural measure. Um, basically, multi-story buildings create greater load loads on foundation and soil systems. So, without a proper proper engineering soils boring report, it's hard to determine what kind of foundation works best with the soil type. So to avoid problems such as settlement or foundation cracking and what, whatnot, uh, uh, the, the structure uh, will have a height limitation. Uh, another reason for height limitation is soft story design. This is a very well documented, documented engineering principle. Basically what it is, it's if a building doesn't have enough shear walls, for example, if the exterior walls are too much of a wide open space where the interior doesn't have the shear walls needed for stability, what happens in the, of a, in the seismic event, basically the base, base story collapses as seen in these pictures. Uh, it's happened all over the state and, uh, previously and uh, we wish to avoid this. Uh, the California Division of Mines and Geology states that there's no active faults in Trinity County. However, there are many inactive faults and we are close to <coughs> big um, uh, fault lines and the uh, subduction uh, system on the coast, so so we potentially are at risk of these uh, seismic events. So this is yet another mitigating measure. Uh, just to make the point clear, Burke Ranch, April 30th, 2008, 5.4 Richard scale. Uh, this was the largest earthquake recorded in Trinity County. 5.4. I've been through with several earthquakes myself. Uh, 5.4 is a good shape, and it, you can potentially, if the structure is not built adequately, this, as seen in the image, could most definitely. Yeah. Next, uh, next one is fire safety requirements. Now, chapter 7A of the California Building Code uh, states that building permits built, uh, applied for after July 1st, 2008 within fire hazard severity zones or wildlife interface zones have to comply with materials and construction methods for exterior wildlife exposures. This document, essentially what it is, it's a, it's a list of uh, not only materials that uh, that needs to be used if you're specified in, in these fire, fire uh, wildfire uh, uh, hazard severity zones, it also lists uh, different methodologies for construction. And essentially, what the purpose of it is to uh, mitigate or minimize the induction of of, of a fire into your home. Uh, different types of siding or how it's flat, um, the ratings for materials, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so fire hazard severity zones, um, there's three uh, responsibility areas. It can, it's local, uh, deemed by the state uh, and by federal government. Uh, it's, it can be a local jurisdiction or local responsibility zone, state responsibility zone, and federal responsibility zone. Local would be, for example, a, a city, a city fire department. Uh, state would be CAL FIRE. CAL FIRE uh, uh, takes care of state responsibility zones. And federal would be a forest service fire. Um, this map shown in this, uh, in this PowerPoint is the Trinity County Fire Hazard Severity Zone. These maps are created for every county in California. Uh, this is the one for Trinity County specifically. There are spots shown in yellow, uh, orange, and red, and these indicate fire probability or fire intensity that could take place within the county. Um, I've been in contact with Greg Anderson, who is a division chief and code compliance and analyst with uh, the California Fire Marshal's Office. 
mean, he actually, my question when looking at this map is like, okay, well, what about the areas in green that are under federal responsibility? Do they need to comply with the provisions uh, of ch Chapter 7A? And uh, he actually indicated that because it's under federal responsibility, uh, these structures do not, and these areas do not need to comply with, uh, with uh, the provisions of materials and construction methodologies. Um, again, this is not to discourage anyone from doing this. Uh, th this document is presented and assembled after much research and testing of materials, and it's highly encouraged for the protection of your home to adhere to this. However, uh, I guess according to Mr. Anderson, uh, if you're in a federal zone, you don't need to comply with this. So, so in summary, um, so we've gone over the importance of introducing Class A to Trinity County, uh, the opportunity empowerment for community members to make the best use of their land and the resources they have available to build a home for themselves and the family. This proposed ordinance that's being presented today bridges the gap from the 1986 Mendocino Class K to what, where we are today. It takes <coughs> into consideration, I stated before, uh, changes in state legislation, uh, uh, health and safety codes, fire provisions, um, Basically, in, in this last 20 minutes, I presented to you administrative and construction requirements to mitigate potential problems that may occur and to basically for the safety of all stakeholders involved. Um, I believe that innovative solutions need to be taken by county officials here in Trinity County. We can't just rely on the status quo and what's done before. This is an old proposal, as I said before, dating from the late 1960s in California, the late state legislation, yet it's an innovative approach that we need to take today um, here in Trinity County. Um, lastly, I want to say that we're not reinventing the wheel here by proposing a Class K. The, the mechanisms are in place, the building department's in place, the plan review process is in place, the inspection process is in place. So this, sh this should be a smooth transition, I hope, to facilitate this as an introduction uh, to Trinity County. Is it going to be perfect? No, nothing's perfect. We all know that. But the benefits that can be derived from this Class K would far outweigh any problems that could potentially come up. So I encourage you, if this makes sense to you, um, contact your Board of Supervisors member, get the ball rolling. You know, we know as in Trinity County, if we unite, we can make things happen. And I also urge my fellow commissioners to uh, vote for an <coughs> approval and um, to uh, to recommend to the Board of Supervisors for, for its adoption. So with that said, thank you very much for your attention. I just want to clarify one item. There, there currently is not a proposed ordinance. This is a sample ordinance only for discussion. Um, an ordinance would be directed and required to go through the Board of Supervisors. Thank you, Council. Sample ordinance. So um, with that said, Commissioner, staff, are there any questions before we open public, uh, public comment? I have, I have a question. I have to confess, I did not read the entire thing. My life has been very epic. But um, my question relates to current, can you go over how this would affect buildings that have already been built and how, thank you, <laughs> how they could, but still, if you could yeah. mention because I think that's something that, that is important to a lot of people. Okay, uh, I guess more informal. So that's in Section 4, Regulations of Use D, Existing As-Built Structures. Any person owning a, an existing structure in Trinity County which complies with the provisions of this chapter as an owner built limited density rural dwelling may within three years from the adoption of this ordinance submit an application paid to be in pending successful inspection and obtain a certificate of occupation. Okay, so now any other questions, commissioners or clarification to staff as well? Being that there's not real open, open public comment, again, this is a workshop setting, so it's informal, but just to keep some kind of structure to the meeting, we're open public comment. Anyone wishing to address the commission regarding this item, uh, please come forward, state your name for the record. 
Good evening. My name is Travis Perkins. Uh, I just had a couple questions about this. Uh, first off, why would it be limited to more rural environments versus residential rural? Uh, like uh, basically saying I live on the outside of Weaver, but I'm still hooked up to water. Why would I be not allowed to uh, pursue this? Well, basically, um, the, the this is an, I guess it's an arbitrary. Mm -hmm. Re requirement, I guess. I mean, because of the basically the intention of the capacity <laughs> when, when it was first introduced, and as I as I mentioned, still stands today because um, it's more geared to those isolated geographically from their neighbors because of any mishaps or, or things that might occur to the structure. You don't you don't want to directly affect your neighbor as well. Mm -hmm. So um, it, as the name implies, limited density, rural built. So. Uh, it was deemed that to exclude the main four um, community service districts because they are the most populated in the county. Essentially, that's 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 why. It's the closest uh, thing. It, it is exactly it's the closest yeah. thing we have as to yeah. this. Yeah. So, uh, with with that, can we at least make room for exemptions so people could at least apply? And once you find, because like, I live on an acre and a quarter. But everybody around me also lives on an acre and a quarter. So we're not really high density compared to, I mean, compared to the front ranch, yes, for density, but uh, just a, I just wanted to see if maybe we could leave it open for people I, to I, I, don't see, I don't see why not. I mean, that, again, as, cam, as County Council stated, this is a draft ordinance. Yes. Yeah, so well, there's lots of room for, for changes. And, and, and again, this is a community setting, a, a workshop, so uh, suggestions are always welcome. So yes, I, I don't see why, why we couldn't do a variance process, per se, for, for, for this type of ordinance. Absolutely. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Perkins. I'm Veronica Toyabis with uh, from Douglas City. Um, <coughs> I know he was saying a quarter and an acre, and this would state no less than two and a half acres. Is there any particular reason you were looking at nothing less than two and a half acres? Um, you know what? There's not honestly, mm -hmm. and again, it's, it's a number because um, you know just so, so you're you're isolated from your neighbors essentially. Mm -hmm. You know, just just as I, I indicated to Mr. Perkins, like into, just so you're not any any issues with your home would not directly affect your neighbor. So it was it was essentially an arbitrary size of, of the parcel. But again, it can definitely be reduced. You know, pending the commission and, and the staff uh, staff research in, in such matters. Absolutely. I've been looking out for the um, and. Looking at that, if you know you have something in here, you've got the people that would come in and build for the maybe the purpose of creating rentals down the road, and it shall be liable for the uh, revocation of their certificate of occupancy. Is there anything you're going to build in to have something a little stronger? Don't you do it? You know, I mean, I mean because there are there is that possibility, and it leaves that door open for those to come in and build those rental units, and then that can create other hassles. Where I, I love the intent of this. Yes. And for uh, thinking outside the box, that's fantastic. That's exactly what it needs. Um, but I think that's something that you might want to take a look at and kind of button up a little bit, or at least have some some real measures there. I, I actually um, I, I've been in contact with uh, Mr. Santiago, Jim Santiago. Um, so we bounced some ideas off, but. We haven't really had the opportunity to sit, sit down line item by line item, and, and you know I would definitely appreciate the opportunity to do so and get more feedback due to his expertise, and, and that would be one topic that would definitely be open to his, his suggestions. Yeah, because if you're going to give them that, you want to help them. You want it to be there to help them, and not. Absolutely. Um, and you have um. For Section C on the permits, the exception, permit should not be required for small or unimportant work or alterations or repairs that do not present a health or safety hazard. It goes on. Who's going to determine what is small or unimportant? Because if you ask me or my husband, you're going to get two different answers. <laughs> but in real, realistically, will you have a list that is not 
subjective. Um, or, you know, obviously maybe an opportunity for them to come in and say, hey, what about this? So that we don't pin, you know, pigeonhole it too much. But that might be something, what, what would you consider small and unimportant? And unimportant may not be small and unimportant to someone else. Absolutely. So, I, but I love having that freedom in there. But my new kitchen, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, and it, uh, I just also then just wanted to say kudos for thinking of outside the box and bringing some new ideas forward and uh, reaching out to the public for our thoughts on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Alvius. Good evening, Tim Whiter, Thanks, Chief Carol Park. Uh, part of my duties is uh, oversight of the, of the fire safety regulations here in Trinity County. So we had a, uh, just a concern, I think I've expressed it in prior meetings uh, regarding the fire safety regulations, either the uh, Trinity County or the uh, California Code of Regulations, Title 14, uh, Division 1.5, Chapter 7. Of the state standards, and the reason for this is, and why we're so concerned, obviously uh, the year we've had and the Molina fire that we've had over here, um, these remain an ignition source for us for wildland fires, particularly uh, allowing electrical and uh, mechanical and, and uh, heating uh, facilities. So, with that, we would like to uh, to see something in there referencing uh, fire safety standards at minimum the, the Trinity County standards, um, which we've also discussed that need to be brought up to uh, the standard with the uh, Title 14 state regulations. Uh, and uh, we do appreciate and notice um, that the 2,500 gallons for uh, firefighting was under the domestic water, maybe putting that under the fire safety, regula or the fire safety requirements so that we have the 2,500 gallons. Um, the the uh, fire safety regulations allow for ingress and egress, so while having uh, firefighting water at hand, we still have to be able to access it. Um, the fire safety regulations allow for um, ingress and egress of, of fire and emergency equipment, and um, things like setbacks as well because of the, uh, the ignition source for wildfire uh, remains in those regulations. So we'd, like, we'd just like to see uh, those not left out of this, just uh, for those reasons. So, uh, the other thing uh, was the uh, uh, the comment regarding FRA. Uh, FRA is land owned by the federal government, and uh, I don't believe uh, they sell that to build upon. Um, so most of it would would still be SRA owned lands. <laughs> now, with that, the the federal uh, the federal fire agencies do protect some SRA land because of the intertwining of land and uh, for the, uh, the benefit of use of resources and those kinds of things and, and quickly accessing an incident. We do land swaps. Um, so while it, it is under federal protection, it's still under state ownership. So just a closer look at some of that we can have, uh, have a discussion needed to regarding that. Um, Appreciate you coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think that Rich said we're not really messing with you here or anything. I thought that was kind of funny because uh, until I got into Canada's program, thought that we kind of had class K having in there. It just was like, they just, you know, that few of them built the house. Or you built the barn because you needed a barn. Um, or you built your driveway because you wanted to build a house. That's changed not just for growers. It's changed for tons of people. I know that we've talked about a neighbor of yours that the county happened to see their house and said, whoa, you built a house here with your own hands? You can't do that, sorry. Uh, I grew up in a community on the East Coast that was a lot like Trinity County. Uh, I grew up in a house, a close to house that was built by the previous family. 
beautiful, gorgeous home. I came out here, like a lot of people are here, like a lot of people that grow up here that kind of want to maybe we'll call it like a new world homesteading. Um, love of life, a lot of big pieces of land, great timber, had kind of a forester on it before I even bought it because I wanted to make sure that there was good timber on it. I wanted to make sure it was a sound investment, and I also wanted to build a home for them. Um, I figured while I was working on building a home, I'd live in one of the most uh, engineering-wise strongest structures there is in a geodesic dome. Um, I built my roads, my house, I developed my property, I built a business. Come to find out, every single step of that journey is an operational reality in Trinity County. People are doing it and have done it for generations here. But every step of that journey is forbidden by this county's building and by this county's regulations. Um, I know that all of you guys know that. I know you guys have neighbors that don't. Did you see it? Um, there's, I guess with Google Earth, you can't keep living the way that we were here. You can't just build a garage and say, hey, it's cool. I do think that we have to balance that with the reality that not everybody is a good actor. Not everybody is going to build a great post into your house that's going to stand up for 100 years. Um, there's always people that want to abuse you know, they want to take them off. But where is the line that we say, no, you good guys can't do this. You can't mill wood to build a shed for your tractor because there's some tweaker that's going to ruin it for You know, where do we balance that? That's a tough one. Um, a lot of, I think, the rules and regs and stuff that I've gotten from talking to Jim Santiago and Jeff Dickey over the years, a lot of them stem from fire, 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 fire. Home fires, fire safety, wildfires. Obviously, this is a pretty real thing. <coughs> For folks that live rurally here, you are your fire protection. Something lights on fire on my property behind two lock gates and there's three and a half miles of driveway at the end of 10 miles of dirt road. How fire is going to get there once there's 250 acres of the fire? Hey, for a volunteer fire department, hopefully will crash through my gate because I know that I'm going to come up and save my life. But the reality is that it's going to take them a long time. Um, I know from talking to uh, a Cal Fire representative recently working on uh, my property that there have been requests and maybe compensation <coughs> with Cal Fire for people that both properties my family have are one surrounded by national forest on the four sides, the other one surrounded by SPF on the four sides. I have to keep my short driveway up to Cal Fire standards, but the other two miles of it that are on SPI can be in complete disrepair, and it doesn't matter. That doesn't really make logical sense. The ambulance isn't going to be able to get through three miles to then drive on, you know, 60 feet of nice driveway. Maybe this board or the Board of Supervisors, or, or whoever, uh, would be able to talk to Cal Fire, because I know the house conversation has happened, and maybe come up with some, <coughs> I'm not aware, I know there's a couple in the room, but some kind of uh, release of liability, something that, hey, you live on a square mile of land, you built your own home, these fire regulations that were designed maybe for Los Angeles, probably aren't going to be applicable. You know, you don't need to rebuild three and a half miles of road to pull off every two feet. Maybe I could sign and say, you don't have to come save me. You know, the fire sprinklers, that minute and a half, two minutes, whatever it buys the firefighters is not really applicable when you live that early. Nor do I believe we have fire crews that even really are set up to utilize it. Um, maybe that's an option. Something for you guys to discuss. I don't know if it's even an option with Cal Fire. I know that it's been talked about a little bit, but that might be something that could be coupled with Class K. I know that tons of places in California have Class K. Um, and I think that if we had been on that forefront of doing everything by rules and regulations in Trinity County, we would have had it the day it came out. But it kind of didn't matter until, it mattered until people 
that we care about the housing as well. So that's all we think about. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Russell. to invest more in my property if this was passed, although I would encourage you to include some kind of water storage or rain catchment requirement, 2,500 to about 5,000 gallons, specifically for the dwelling, as well as setback requirements. I do think that we need to reevaluate some of the three acre conversion requirements for building. We have recently experienced some challenge with our conversion due to a road and Cal Fire permitting for our road. So I certainly agree with some of the points that Mr. Gross and Chris brought up. Um, however, I think we should have a lot more conversation about that before we make any decisions. So, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Belanco. <clears throat> Good evening, Commissioner Justin Hawkins, State Court. Um, I first want to just go ahead and thank the Chairman, um, in particular, and other people, including Commissioner Fraser, for bringing us forward. It's pretty rare for us to have someone thing that we all agree on, or mostly agree on, in the Commission as a community. So it's it's a moment I think we, we need to savor and really take advantage of. Um, I'm actually pretty impressed with a lot of the details in the sample ordinance. Um, it's been thought out. The three inspection steps are um, something I thought that helps give other agencies the comfort that things are being monitored, especially utilities hidden within the walls. So that's a great step. I did have a question for the commission regarding that and with the uh, section, sorry, it's uh, 4D regarding existing as-built structures. It says you have three years to adopt after the adoption of this ordinance. Say the fee pending successful inspection. So that would mean that you would need to go back through the first, the all three inspections here. Is that correct? Including the second one. You have to well, that would be difficult. How do you inspect? You know, like your electrical and all that after, you know, the walls are closed up. I, I don't really know how that would be feasible. You can do the, the minor electrical inspection, which is the major city plan that you have that you have to test for background faults or anything like that, but you wouldn't be able to do a full-scale inspection without taking off I mean, I don't, I don't, you know, how, how could that be conducted for our apps? You get on the crawl space and see you, how your foundation is built, or it's supposed to beam, are you anchored, or using the proper Simpson ties, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I mean, I, it's difficult. I mean, I, 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 that probably wasn't thought through, but I mean, I, I did all the I see just the possibility for, for yeah. folks to yeah. you know, assist the structure. There, there are certain, I mean, certain electrical things you could look at. You could look at the box, make sure that it, it was appropriate, that it was up to code, nobody had made any alterations, or it was, you know. And basically, um, it, it uh, helps build these standards. If it, there is electrical involved, it'll be, um, it would have to be off grid because pg &E will not give service to an unpermitted structure. So it would be it would be an off-grid house with probably limited amount of electricity and the, oh, okay. so it would be it, it would it should be something that could be dealt with electrical wise. Plumbing wise, I think you would have to kind of take it from the owners uh, it'd be however long they lived in the house, if it still worked, um, it's probably the it, 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 they did it a decent job, and most of the, I wouldn't. I think that would be some. They you could leave the discretion of the the building inspector. Absolutely. I mean, as and you know, as county indicated, county council. This is a draft ordinance. I mean, a lot of a lot of steps have not been worked out because it hasn't really have had to. Like it's okay, we're launching this now. We have to really 
think of all these minute details. So uh, like I, I appreciate the suggestion, and you're right. I mean, it would have to be some kind of, perhaps as uh, Mrs. Albius indicated, like a comprehensive list of, okay, it's in the sixth structure. Okay, what do we inspect, or how do we go about this? So, you know, that's, there's definitely room for, for that. Yeah, I, you know, with the recorded covenant section here, and obviously a new owner due diligence, a new purchaser's due diligence to inspect a house, I think a lot of that would apply here too. And the mechanisms seem reasonable to allow for, you know, a citizen to develop buy a house and <clears throat> be responsible for their decisions. Um, so that's great. Um, I did want to comment on the water storage seems to come up for fire protection, and I read the comments from Fish and Wildlife in here, and um, there are regulations regarding the storage of water for more than 30 days um, that is surface water. So the way you get around that, we do this with the cultivation a lot, is that to store water for more than 30 days, which you would want to have stored the water for fire exclusively. Um, I think having fire water separate from domestic makes a lot of sense. Um, just to make sure it's there. And if that water was filled with groundwater or um, rainwater catching off of a roof, it's exempt from storage requirements um, from State Water Resources Control Board. Um, a storage. They have, it is called an appropriated right. I think it's small domestic use would be the typical one. Um, the permit we would need for storage of surface water from within 30 days. But that would be exempt again, like I said, if it was um, rainwater catchment or groundwater well. Um, and uh, also, you know, somehow we've managed to survive this point in our, you know, human existence without a lot of extra regulations. And I, I, I am alive, and my family have lived generations without sprinklers and a lot of other residential things. And living in Trinity County, I don't think anything can be more true that you are inherently need to be self-reliant when your sheriff's response is three hours or more. Um, when a Fork Fire District tends to not show up at all because they are extremely short staff. And it's an unfortunate reality. I think that, like other people have said, that being prepared to deal with the problems on your own is just a fact of life around here, especially if you're not in the communities, you know, like Hay Fork or the center of the smaller areas. It's just part of life. So I, I think that um, the residents of this county are mature enough and able to accept the responsibility that comes with living here, and it matches very well with the ordinance you presented. I encourage you to move forward with it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hawkins. Good evening, John Brower from Junction City, and uh, like the previous speakers, and uh, Mr. Hawkins, I also want to encourage uh, some sort of action on this team. Um, this is a long time overdue and uh, could really bring benefit to the community. I mean, uh, Commissioner Frazier's district in particular probably has, I don't know, about as many unpermitted as permitted structures, I would guess. And this is a means of you know, encouraging compliance. And um, I think uh, in the big picture, making everybody safer. And uh, the notion of Taking responsibility for oneself is something that we're proud of here in Trinity, and this is a good fit. Um, back to the conversation about uh, inspections of uh, electrical, plumbing, mechanical within already sealed up interior walls. Perhaps you could say something like to be inspected to the greatest extent practical. practical. You know, a building inspector could open up the panel and open up a few boxes, test polarity, test uh, ground fault, um, uh, you know, the simple testers. And if they see something out of whack at the main panel or, or anywhere else, then maybe it justifies a more in-depth inspection, maybe cutting some holes, perhaps even Swiss cheese. But if everything, you know, on a cursory inspection, and to the greatest extent, you know, feasible, practical, um, maybe the, that would be a reasonable place to draw a line. And I think, um, you know, we 
there's experts in the room, Mr. Forslund. Um, uh, as far as the um, uh, being recorded in covenants and being able to show up in a title search, something like that, I think that makes a lot of sense. I wouldn't know the proper way to do it, but uh, Daryl would. And um, so maybe he can comment on that. And uh, I also want to thank Commissioner Ford and Frazier and everyone else who's had a hand in this. This is long overdue and it can really bring uh, great benefit to our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grower. I'm Gail Goodyear from Weaverville. And I would like to echo Veronica all these comments about looking at the intended and unintended consequences of such a proposal. And I would like to share a little bit of a historic perspective. In 2002, I was in Washington, D.C. for a meeting, and part of it was about housing. And someone commented to me outside of the meeting, one of the counties you work for is Trinity County, and it has the highest home ownership per, per capita in the nation compared to income. And um, how's that possible? So I was like, I'll go on that. <laughs> so um, anyway, part of how it came about was people who were working in the woods constructed during their off season. And they built a variety. We have uh, a variety of types of housing in Trinity County. And you know, not a lot of repeat floor plans. So one of the concerns that I have about this, uh, <clears throat> how these people created these homes, was then when they wanted to go sell them in the past 18 years, they um, did not qualify for home loans for their potential buyers. And so the people who decide to do K-1 housing should the proposal pass need to be looking at um, the future buyers and whether they would be able to qualify for a home loan to purchase such property and also what the insurance companies might be requiring as well. And so those are um, two of the consequences that I think we would look at. What else I found out was Many of the houses that did not qualify for a home loan, it was the foundation that didn't meet the building code requirements. There you go. Give us a good year. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Howdy. Thanks for having me. I'm Jason Bachelor, a local uh, general contractor, and uh, I've worked on a lot of these. Uh, buildings and uh, actually was able to bring um, some out buildings up that they were apparently signed off by an inspector, but for foundation, uh, retrofitting, stuff like that. But I'd also like to point out that uh, <clears throat> Mendocino County has, well, passed it 30 years ago, their resolution, and uh, there's 10 times the population in that county. Um, but this county is, uh, I mean, probably half the jobs I work on are, you know, there's uh, non permitted dwellings and barns and outbuildings everywhere. And uh, pretty much in any rural county, that's, you know, pretty, pretty standard. Um, I've lived in seven different counties in Northern California. It was the case everywhere in the world. And uh, also, this county has a lot of homesteads that uh, some of them are only accessible by trail down in the southern community. And, uh, so, I mean, the this this has to pass for, you know, just for some revenue to the county, but also just to resolve. I mean, uh, you know, you can't, uh, say, sell a homestead that's got, you know, all these uh, this dirt foundation and logs, you know, cedar logs that on the on the forest floor, you know, of course, nobody's going to be able to get a loan on that, like they were saying. But I have been able to uh, 
work through homeowners, and I have brought up a few uh, buildings to uh, standards for the foundation, and that was that was easy enough because it's an easy visual inspection. So anyway, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Messner. I'm sure will develop if this moves forward, which I hope it does. Um, but as regards off grid properties, I am off grid and we have multiple sources of energy on our property. We have a planned solar array and we have hydroelectric, which have both been signed off on, and we have a backup generator. It might be prudent to look at emissions or some kind of clause for noise. If you have an on-grid property that wants to transition to slightly off-grid and then use backup generators to supplement power, I mean, it's just a conversation, but just listening to all the points that have been raised, energy wasn't brought up, so I thought it prudent to say something. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bullock. Any other comments from the public? Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair, member of the Commission, Tom Belenco, Douglas City. Um, well, I said she owns 80 acres in Douglas City, and uh, rural, I think, is great. Uh, I, I do want to thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, particularly Commissioner Fraser for being diligent on this subject in the face of, uh, let me diplomatically call it bureaucratic friction, uh, <laughs> which without your persistence uh, would continue to be policy uh, in the face of really what I think is strong support in the county for uh, this type of, of code. And we, we've talked about this at great length and uh, in looking at uh, the state regs that are kind of a model for this. Um, there are many ways here where I, I notice, I, I can see the work you put into crafting this, and I do appreciate that. There, you, you condensed it to 20 minutes, but I'm sure several uh, tens of hours. Uh, it's that as well, and I appreciate that. Um, some of the things that I, I, I see do come from the state is the uh, that two-year prohibition on renting so for the, the owner built part of owner built means you're building it for yourself and that's straight out of the state requirements and I, i'm glad to see that there and how we enforce that you know that is a bit of a question but it is valid it, it's true we're not supposed to be using these to build like cheap rental structures it, it's for the owner um, in terms of uh a couple people asked about what what is considered substantial enough for an inspection. I know the state uh, says, you know, this is pretty much an exemption to the uh, structural code, but as far as electrical and plumbing, you got to stay with the, the building code on that. So I think those are the kinds of things that would fall under major. Structurally, you know, rather than saying, you know, replacing one piece of drywall is not structural, but if you replace seven, you know, in, instead of getting crazy with it, you say plumbing, uh, electrical, you know, environmental health, anything like that, need, or, or anything that might affect the structure or footprint of the house. I just throw out some ideas there, but um, and then uh, a couple of things we actually tightened up here. Snow load, I think, is an appropriate tightening over what what the state requires. I think acknowledging where we are and. Uh, uh, what can happen, you know, I, I hope we get the kind of snow that our snow load says we can. Um, and not tonight, but in terms of, yeah. uh, and, um, in terms of the three inspections, the state only requires one, and, and I think maybe for the existing buildings, uh, 
the, the, the equivalent of a final, uh, and I think the state language calls it a health and safety inspection, um, would probably be appropriate for existing. But I, I do think uh, it's appropriate the way you, you allow the three inspections because, you know, when the walls are closed up, it's hard to tell if electric and plumbing has been done to code. Um, and the fire is a good thing, and it, it, it's, it does apply to this, but I think, uh, I know Cal Fire has mentioned this before, that we do have to revisit our, our county ordinances on that. And I, I think having seen far too much uh, close experience with uh, fires we've had, more even than anything you do of what you build your house is uh, the uh, defensible space. And I'd like to see us maybe push that out a little bit further. I know maybe some of the other agencies might have some problems with that, but I think if there's one thing we can do for our safety of our structures is really push out that defensible space. And, and you know, 2,500 gallons is the bare minimum uh, volume of water I think anybody wants to fight fires around here. Um, but otherwise, uh, you know, I'm, uh, just in closing, uh, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll admit I'm a bit of a weirdo. Most people know we already know that. Um, I read laws like some people read mystery novels. You know, I'm, I'm also a kind of a competitive weirdo. So I want to know when I read a good law, I'm like somebody thought of a really great idea. How they think of that? Um, so I kind of go in and dig into the research and. In researching this, uh, uh, the mouthful that we call Class K, you know, we're built in a density rural dwelling. Um, every law that gets written, it says, what, where the authority, what, where the authority for the statute comes from. And uh, for this, uh, the law says, it, it cites the health and safety code where, where building codes are. And then it cites to Article 1, Section 1 of the California Constitution, which is our preamble. I mean, that, that's the legal equivalent of saying, well, because I said so. And, and, you know, it's not civics class, not to recite it for you, but basically it's, it's our constitutional preamble, and it says uh, that all persons, well, we've amended it, we used to say men, but it's all persons, as, as it should, uh, are free and independent, and have certain inalienable rights among them, defending life and liberty, and acquiring and possessing property. Uh, and that's that little phrase, acquiring and possessing property, is where this came from. And that's a very important thing, that people have the right to live on their property. Uh, and, and the building code was never supposed to stand in the place of somebody's right to provide for their family on their property, even if they have an ax. That's it. Uh, so, if a statute has any validity, I mean, if there's anything that gives us the right to pass a law, it's, it's making uh, our Constitution apply more directly. I think this does that, and I, I'm really happy to see it. Really encourage you to move forward with it, and thank you again. And, uh, you know, I, I hope the Commission stays on top of this as, uh, as we move into the next year. There will be some shifting chairs and new faces on the board of suit, but I'd love to see us continue to push this until uh, until we have it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walker. <clears throat> there before the we leader one name got brought up, so I thought I'd throw a couple of comments on this because um, clearly if, if somebody is making a decision to build something that doesn't need some kind of building code, there needs to be documentation of that recorded so people know it. One of the comments I heard today tonight was that maybe I could make an arrangement with the fire department that says that my place burns, you don't have to come. If you do that, it better be on record because the subsequent buyer of that property needs to know that that was the arrangement made when that property was built. So getting this stuff on record is probably uh, really critical. <coughs> I suspect that Class K housing probably doesn't qualify for the solution of lo uh, loans anyway. Uh, and the reality is that when a bank makes a loan to you, they don't keep that loan, they sell it on the market. And so when they're selling those loans, they want them to be a specific kind of quality. And so it is unlikely that uh, Class K housing probably would uh, qualify for institutional financing. They probably have to be on a carry back if you were going to sell it. I mean, just as a general rule. So, uh, but I think it would be pretty important to uh, 
make sure that something on the record indicates this property was built to some other standard than what people would generally think of. If you're walking up to a house and buying it, you're probably figuring there's a drilling permit on it and everything's going to be fine. Well, that may or may not be the case. <laughs> the other comment that I think is interesting is that from the standpoint of the assessor's office, I think it would be really nice to see permits on a lot of them. <laughs> Unpermitted buildings, so they would be the, the properties on the tax rolls that probably aren't on the rolls right now. So, um, but anyway, I think it's important that whatever decisions people make relative to the impact of their property gets recorded in a way that the subsequent purchaser of that property would be aware of those decisions that could, by with well understanding what that is. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ford. Jeff Cadella, uh, Xenia. Um, I, I support this wholly. Um, I have no intention of building any class K structures, but there's certain deficiencies in the county with the uh, reality of where we're at. Um, I talk to a lot of business owners, um, and they have trouble finding good help. A lot of the population is drunk or on drugs. Um, they have trouble recruiting like bringing people into the area because they can't find anywhere to live. Um, there's, there's a lot of benefits. Uh, also the economic side of just, you know, having some more construction going on. I think, I think it's a good thing. Um, seems very practical, the presentation presented. Um, also what people have said with the potential of the use of people building rental units. Um, that That's certainly a thing. There's potential for that. Um, I think allowing a property owner to build a second residence if their zoning allows it, um, maybe a little uh, more affordably, is something that's a good thing. It could allow, you know, an older couple to generate some revenue on their land. Um, it could um, allow their, maybe one of their kids to actually have a home there and stay in the county and uh, raise a family. Without having to live with mom and dad. Um, so I think allowing possibly another class K on a property that already has, like, say, a, a permitted residence, however you deem what size property, or, you know, I don't need to get into the details of how that needs to look, but um, keep it in mind that it can be abused. Um, I, I also think it could be very beneficial to uh, current residents as well as help bring more building, more housing, more affordable housing uh, to the county. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Kelly Alpes again, let me see. Hearing a lot about the banking and the money, and so that may be something you want to take a look at with what's going to be in the ordinance. Um, because if they're going to need a loan to build the housing, that might be something, there might be a trigger within what you're allowing them to leave out, that if it was just left back in, that would allow them to get the loan. So that might be something you also want to take a look at. Because it'd be great to have it, but if they can't get the money to build it, it's just an ordinance on paper. So that might be something to reach out what the banks are requiring on, on that as well. Thank you, Mr. Mrs. Obvious. Anyone else? Um, yeah, this is a formal setting. You don't even have to get up. Now you sound like you should have jumped in the chair. Any other comments or additions? I just don't want you to approach the mic because I've had a cold, but I've had a lot of things I wanted to say tonight. But I just want to thank you guys both, specifically uh, Supervisor Commissioner Frazier for bringing this up. County really needs it, and like we've heard all the comments, but damn, if you look around, you'd think we had a Class K ordinance already, <laughs> so we might as well do it again to bring it all back into compliance, and maybe, uh, and maybe we'll see improvement in the tax rates. Thank you, Mr. Keys. Any other comments? I, I think something else to think about too is uh, a lot of folks in this community have built their homes and their homesteads without traditional financing. Uh, so the whole bank home thing, I don't think 
31, I've owned a bunch of properties. I've never been able to get a loan from a bank in my life. I still have a home. Uh, so it's something that would work really well with this community with people who necessarily aren't working in 95, getting a bank loan, paying a mortgage forever. You know, you can kind of build your life with many guys. Yeah. I think with the reality of moving into the future with all these uh, structures that have burned in, you know, like New County, Jasper County, it's just going to be that much harder to get people like, you know, engineers and contractors to come out here and do anything when there's so much need. Um, so it's just, I don't know, I guess a way to like move forward uh, and maybe entice more people to move here. One more question. Uh, as far as the um, like mill wood goes, does that still need a greater in checker, or is can that be taken off the property? Do you need it, where does it land with the THP or something like that? It's uh, it, the way it's stated in state law. The way I read it, um, you can use homemade lumber. You can use recycled materials. That's that's where the savings comes in. Is um, you're not required to go get the graded lumber. The and engineered plants. It's simple, as long as it's simple construction and the, what's it called for in the state breaks down, the inspector can't see any evidence of dry rot, white spec, uh, excessive checking, and it's, the lumber would be good enough. Great. I got a question, maybe it's more for Cal Fire. Uh, if you are building off of your own property, your own cover, I know that I can harvest firewood for myself, not for sale or trade, without a conversion. Would you be able to harvest and mill your own timber without it doing a conversion? I, <clears throat> I believe, and I'm not a, a, a licensed forester, but um, that any time you're going to take timber off of your property and, and you're going to utilize it, you, you need a timber harvest plan. Anything over a few trees. So, but uh, I could I could follow up with that if you need to. There's some uh, damn Dressel House stuff that. Uh, oh, I know that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's the one that can answer that. Yeah. A lot. <laughs> yeah. So. We like it. Yeah, yeah, no, it's good things. So, maybe there could be some discussion of tying a three-acre conversion, possibly an additional three-acre conversion, to a property if you're building a Class K house or bringing it into. You know, because then that's going to allow people to do a bigger defensible space, to do the right fire preparedness, to do it right, you know. Yes. Yeah. 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 to more of a workshop setting. Um, so we can invite other interested parties, building department, uh, CAL FIRE, and you know, other agencies and so on. What sort of feedback are you getting from the building department? They would be on the front lines of this. And uh, I understand that you know they've been reluctant for decades um, to adopt this here, but does it, does it seem to be game for something like this? Well, I can't speak for the building department, but I can say that they did give comments. And Jim Santiago, he said, well, it's okay, you can propose whatever it is you'd like, but you need to keep in mind that it still needs to be filed. You know, even we can say whatever we want to have, but it still needs to be filed appropriately. So that's, and there's a criteria that you need to meet as you do that. So 
that was where, and in the staff report it says, whatever it is you come up with, we recognize that there's going to be some staff time. And so before we start going down that road too far with all the other competing priorities that we have, we want to make sure that whatever it is you propose to the board, they recognize that we can spend the time following through on. So that's part of it as well. That until there's like a clear file. direction on it. Can, can building, start, standards, building standards. Just it, like the it has to be filed with the Building Standard Commission for approval. Um, we, we, I appreciate everyone's comments, and, and it, it's, the informality is refreshing. However, um, just in the interest of time, let's limit it to a couple more comments. If there's anyone else wishing to comment, please. I actually. Uh, is there anyone else from the public? Otherwise, we'll close public comment and bring it back to the commission. We'll do so. Thank you, everyone. I just want to, my, my, just I just want to comment on the fact. From, from personal experience that just because you have a house that's been permitted and they had all of the inspections and everything has been done right doesn't mean you're not going to have a um, deck that's eight feet off the ground that is slowly sliding down the hill and you're not going to have a wall in your kitchen where that is bowing I mean you know thing, things happen things happen and and it's it's a fallacy to think that having all of your inspections and having a permit makes your building perfect. Absolutely. <laughs> so what's the what's the process from here? I mean, we've gotten some good comments. There's clearly potentially need to be some revisions. Relatively minor and sounds like fairly minor revision. Um, well, um, um, from discussing it earlier with uh, uh, Director Hubbard, um, the process. I'd like to. I'd like to see the commission take action on this. Um, basically, essentially, we could recommend to the board of supervisors the adoption of this. Um, they will visit this, and if they deem it's feasible or they want to move forward, then they would recommend staff to do further investigation, take a closer look at it, uh, definitely include the comments tonight and, and, and other areas of interest and move forward, move forward there. Um, that's, that's essentially, is that, is that correct? Is and then they would give us, based on what we find, staff finds, as we go through and address the comments and try to make sure that we can file that formal filing. There are certain questions that have to be answered, and they give you a format for that. So during that process, if we find certain things we'd have to, I mean, it's really a building issue, it's not a planning issue, it's a building issue, but if there are certain things that would have to come back to the Planning Commission for some reason, then they would. Or if it goes to the board, then it would go there instead. So what action can we take tonight? We request the Board of Supervisors agree with the Planning Commission that we want to move this forward and prioritize staff's you time can, to... You can ask... I mean, we can't, we can't, uh, we can't recommend an ordinance right now if, no. if there are revisions that we... Well, and we, we haven't gotten that kind of detail. We can't so. recommend an ordinance that doesn't exist either. It's a think. sample of yeah. so, <laughs> so. Yeah, You would recommend that staff pursue... Um, addressing the comments received on the ordinance and also legal counsel hasn't you know we haven't had legal go through it yet so um, that would have to happen as well we just need to know that they are okay with staff making the time commitment to deal with it so we make a motion then to ask the supervisors to take up to direct, to staff, direct staff to take up the ordinance and then staff would probably bring it back to us to incorporate those public comments we received and then compare the same example. I mean, we really haven't gotten feedback from the building department other than it is the Building Standards Commission, right? I mean, they haven't Correct. really given detailed comments on, well, that's not really workable or we really need to include this here or whatever. We haven't, I mean, it's Correct. not 
in the I, I would expect that the building department would provide that at some point, but it hasn't happened yet, right? Correct. Well, they at a curse, cursory glance, you know, I mean, he did go through, and you have spoken with him, you've sat down and talked to him, but until it's a, until there's guidance from the board, uh, there's so many other priorities right now that it's difficult, and you know, he's a building official, he's not planning staff. What I, what I would like to see, and as I, I said before, is to move this beyond this court. I'd like to see it, recommend it to the board, and board the board to take it upon themselves to to, to take action on this, or, or to uh, allow staff to uh, plan the staff to, to take a deeper look at this. Uh, that, that's Ho hopefully, deeper look means not very much effort, and we can actually. <laughs> it doesn't. It, it seems like there's no. There's so, not, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of, of really a lot of work involved because it's most like this. CSBC form. Um, the, it's, it's not the, the points that they're asking are, are not that onerous. It doesn't seem like it's pretty. It's pretty straightforward stuff. And I think that I'm just I, I have read this draft a few times, and, and most of these things it seems like are fairly well addressed. And it's I don't think. There'd be any problem with that. I mean, if anything, this has more requirements than some of the other counties. It has more requirements. Last day, so, yeah, so that basically things have changed at the state level too since yeah. some of those other ones were adopted. So that's probably why it needs to be a little bit more robust in terms of some of the health and safety components. So, uh, are we at a workshop mode by any chance? <laughs> Uh, I, I, yeah, I would say so. We, you know, in, in the interest of time, and you know, everyone has had multiple chances to come in and whatnot. I, I like to, I like to, to bring some closure to the meeting. And uh, I'm, we're welcome to after the meeting discuss outside more interesting and applicable points. I'm, I'm happy to hear them all. We need to, we need, need to move forward. I will. Uh, in that spirit of that, then I will make a motion that we uh, suggest to the Board of Supervisors that they take up the, we'll call it for simplicity, Class K ordinance and uh, um, allow staff or direct staff to uh, move forward with it. I second. Any further comments, Commissioners? Discussion? Questions. At this point, let's, let's, let's move it up the okay. chain um, of command. Those, are, or those in favor of the motion presented? Aye. 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 Those against? None. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, we have one more thing on the agenda. Uh, agenda item number six matters from the commission. Commissioners, schedule conflicts, anything that can be brought forward? I guess we'll talk schedules when staff tells us what they're thinking about meetings in December. I, I do have one one matter from the commission, and, and this might intercorrelate with staff. Um, you know, from we know that the, the modular clinic expansion is coming up to the next meeting in December, on December 13th. Apparently, is that still scheduled? December twentieth. December twentieth. <laughs> yeah, they had to go. To, they had to use a different engineer, and it's kind of taking a little bit more time for them to come up the, with the information that they need for the next Weaverville Architectural Review Committee meeting. So December twentieth. Okay. Uh, it, it would, you know, just in light that we were not able to review the Architectural Committee minutes uh, from the last meeting because they were not approved. Uh, if there's any way to expedite that, and so we can. Review these minutes and then have that information. Yeah, Personally, I'm not going to be here for that meeting, but it would be in the interest of the rest of the commission to have that available. So we will not be having a meeting on the 13th. We will be on the 20th. Are we having both? Or are we having both? No, we'd like to have a meeting on the 13th as well. Okay, 13th. <laughs> wow. Awesome. Thank you. Any other uh, matters from the commission? Uh, moving on to agenda item number seven, matters from staff. You took it. 
Are you going to throw it on the 27th, too? Okay, well, with that said, it is 8.49, meeting is adjourned.